We're going to look at Hebrews 11, 7, and take a look at this idea, by faith, work. By faith, work. So we're back in Hebrews 11. It's where we're going to be Sunday nights for the vast majority of this year, this summer in particular. And I love Hebrews 11, God's Hall of Faith, because it beautifully reminds us that what God is looking for is men and women, boys and girls, who will live by faith. You don't have to be the smartest one in the room. you got to walk by faith. You don't have to be the richest one in the neighborhood. You need to live by faith. You don't have to have the best singing voice, the most instrumental skills. You don't have, the, have to have the greatest mind. You don't have to have the perfect family. What God is looking for is men and women, for teenagers, boys and girls, who will simply say, I'm going to live by faith no matter the cost and no matter the consequences. And we've seen how this thing of faith and living by faith is so important. Because as we saw in just the previous verse, Hebrews 11 and verse 6, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. You cannot please Him anyway, but by faith. And so far as we have studied this rich chapter. We have seen what faith is. Then we looked at Abel, who worshipped by faith. We looked at Enoch, who walked by faith. And tonight, for a few minutes, we're going to look at this man, Noah, and how Noah, by faith, worked. Look at verse 7, if you could, one more time. The Bible says this, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So let's consider this thing, uh, the, uh, a faith that works. This, this by faith working idea. And understand that faith works even with an incomplete explanation. Roman numeral one tonight, faith works even with an incomplete explanation. Notice the beginning of that verse seven. It says, by faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. Do you know what Noah had? Noah had an undeniable proclamation from Almighty God. An undeniable proclamation. Now, I love Hebrews 11 because what you get out of Hebrews 11 really has a lot to do with what you know of the rest of the Bible. If you don't know anything about Noah, that verse doesn't mean a whole lot to you. But we understand. We understand the background and the context of who Noah was and what God told him. Look with me at Genesis chapter number 6, and we'll begin in verse 11. The Bible says this, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms thou shalt make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. What Noah had was an undeniable proclamation that God was going to judge the world and that He was going to bring judgment in the form of a catastrophic global flood. And what I love about Noah and the beginnings of this idea about how faith works, how it works with an incomplete explanation, is that Noah was mindful of God's Word. Because what you see is God had spoken... And that was enough. God had spoken. Noah, I'm going to destroy the world. And I'm going to destroy the wicked with it. Noah, make an ark. God had spoken. And that was enough. 
He had an undeniable proclamation. I remind us as we begin tonight that you and I also have an undeniable proclamation. That God has spoken to us. The Bible teaches that He has spoken to us through the incarnate Word. Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 2 reminds us this, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, by whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the world's. And God has spoken to us in this day and age. The Bible says that God sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. He is the incarnate Word of God. He is God made flesh and dwelt among us. I tell you, we would do well to maybe not so much wonder what Jesus would do and actually get in and look at what Jesus did. God has spoken to us through the incarnate Word. He's also spoken to us through the inspired Word. We know 2 Timothy 3.16, for all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction of righteousness. One of the verses I love so much is actually over in 2 Peter. And Peter is relaying an experience that he and several others had on the Mount of Transfiguration and how they heard an audible voice and they saw Moses and Elijah. And it was this incredible experience. But Peter said, when I compare that experience with other things that we have. Here's what we have to understand. That we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Peter said, I had this tremendous experience. I had this experience with the voice of God and with the Son of God and with the saints of God. But saints, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Greater than any experience, greater than any rational deduction, greater than any cultural norm, is the inspired word of God. God has undeniably spoken to us. You know, God had spoke to Moses, and that was enough. God has spoken to me. And God has spoken to you. Is it enough? Is it enough? Along with this undeniable proclamation, Moses also had an unfinished picture. I want you to see God had spoken. And God had given a number of details. He had told about the size of the ark. He had talked about rooms that were going to be constructed. He had talked about pitching it within and without with pitch to to help make it waterproof. And God had given Noah a number of details. But you know what? A lot of really important stuff wasn't covered here. You know, if I were Noah and God had gotten down to like Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 19, listen to this. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring, uh, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee, that, and they shall be male and female. Of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. I just said, Lord, do you know how much Clarentin I'm going to have to buy? Lord, I have a hard time keeping a house plan alive. How am I, number one, going to round up all these animals? Number two, keep them all organized, keep the predators from eating the prey, and so on and so forth. How am I going to keep them alive? How am I going to feed them? How am I going to care for them? If I were Noah, when about the time we got to verses 19 and 20, I'd have some major questions. There was a lot of stuff God didn't tell Noah. Like uh, what Noah was going to do when it was all said and done. And every other thing that had breath was dead. Where would Noah go? What would Noah eat? Where would Noah live? There were a lot of things that God did not tell Noah. And to be honest, even though he had an undeniable proclamation, let's not forget he had an unfinished picture. There were a lot of things that Noah just didn't have the answers to. You know what? We find ourselves there sometimes, don't we? You ever been in a situation where you just wish you could kind of raise your hand and ask a question? 
Like, I'm really glad school's almost done for the year. Like, really glad, okay? Summer's going to be fun. We're looking forward to using those Cedar Point passes that the church got us for Christmas. But there are just some times when I wish it was a little more like a classroom situation and I could raise my hand and say, uh, 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 Lord, I did not understand this. I need you to go back and, and give me a little more detail. God, I need a little bit of clarification. God, maybe you can give me a little bit of uh, understanding about, about where this is going to go. We don't always operate with a complete picture, do we? But here's the truth. A faith that works understands that that is never an excuse for not completely obeying the proclamation. Whether or not you have a complete picture is no excuse for not obeying the proclamation. You know, we expect our kids to obey when they don't understand. Brush your teeth. Why? Just brush your teeth. Or this one I love. Springtime, summertime, time change. It's bedtime. But dad, the sun's still out. It's bedtime. But dad, just, just trust me, go to bed. We expect our kids to obey when they don't understand, don't, don't we? Because we know, we know why it's important to brush your teeth. We know why it's important to, to bathe on a regular basis. We know why it's important to take care of your things. We know why it's important to go to bed on time. And we expect our kids to trust and obey even when they don't understand. Let me ask you, if we expect that of our kids, don't you think God deserves even greater than that from us? That even when we don't have a complete picture, the proclamation is good enough. You know, Paul said this. He said this in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. He said, for now we see through a glass darkly. In other words, right now we don't understand everything we come into contact with. We don't always have a complete picture. But that's why he also said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7 that this is why we walk by faith and not by sight. If you have to see it, if you have to feel it, if you have to understand it, it's not of faith. And therefore, it's not pleasing to God. A faith that works will work with an incomplete explanation. But I want you to notice another thing. Verse number 7 again, the Bible says this, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Not only does faith work even with an incomplete explanation, but faith works with an immovable expectation. An immovable expectation. You know why Noah did what he did? Because he knew God was reliable. That word fear there, as I studied this out, I was surprised. I expected to find the Greek word phobos, which is where we get the idea of phobia. It means like fear, like, ah, spider. And by the way, there are no good spiders. The only good spider is a dead spider, amen? About the same with a bumblebee, amen? And so that's good preaching. If you don't get anything else, good tonight. Ice cream next week, and it's of God. And only good spiders are dead spider. Only good bees are dead bee. All God's people said... There we go. Half of us are spiritual. That's good. <laughs> but this word fear does not have the idea of terror. And so Noah wasn't going, oh no, God's going to destroy. Oh, he wasn't running around in terror. This idea, it literally means to act circumspectly or to revere. In other words, Noah didn't understand everything that God had said that he would knew, but so Noah certainly believed and behaved knowing that God meant every single word. In other words, Noah said, God, that's what you said, and then I am certain that that is what you are going to do. And I am going to live my life accordingly. The reliability of God. 
Oh, the what ifs of life. How much time and trouble do we spend pondering those? The what ifs. But I wonder tonight, what if we just lived as if God's will is always reachable because God's word is always reliable? That even though I don't understand why God said I had to forgive that way, I do. Even though I don't understand why God said I had to give that way, I do. Even though I don't understand why, why God said I need to parent that way, I do. Even though I don't understand why, why God said that, I, I do. Why? Because God said it, and God is reliable. The Bible says that upon hearing the word of God, that Noah took note, not understanding all of what God had said, but believing that God meant every word of what he had said. And I wonder about this sometimes. What if Noah hadn't gone all in? What if Noah had said, you know what, God, I'm pretty sure, but I'm going to hedge my bets. Because I really don't want to miss out on all this life has to offer. All those vacations and all those fun nights and all those... I, you know, Lord, what you're asking is you are asking me to completely devote myself for the next 120 years to building a boat for a catastrophic judgment that has never happened before. What if Noah hadn't gone all in? How sad that would have been. And I wonder what you and I miss when we don't go all in. When you know what? We're pretty sure God, but we hedge our bets lest we miss out in something in this life. I wonder how many of us would be willing to walk on water with Peter and the Lord, or how many of us would have been content to stay in the boat. It's an immovable expectation that God is always reliable, that God's word is always reliable. It's an immovable expectation that if God said it, if Jesus taught it, that if the Bible commands it, that I will do it because God is always reliable. But this immovable expectation on the reliability of God, I want you to notice, what was Noah's secret? How did Noah have faith to go all in on God when the opportunity presented itself? How did Noah get to that place? Well, Noah knew the reliability of God because Noah had a real relationship with God. You look at Noah and you will find the Bible describes him as a just man. That, that has the idea of he measured up. In a corrupt society that was full of violence and wickedness, that means in a corrupt society where the thoughts and intents of the people's hearts was only wicked continually, in a corrupt society where the people of God had compromised with the people of this world. And by the way, the problem in Genesis chapter 6 wasn't so much that there was evil in this world. The moment Adam sinned, there was evil in this world. And the problem wasn't so much that there was evil in this world. You go back and read chapter 6, you'll find the problem was that the people of God were so quick to compromise with the evil. And by the way, let's be careful in our day, lest we blame this group, that group, the other group. The world's going to act like the world. The lost are going to act like the lost until, Lord willing, we reach them and bring them to Christ. The prince of the power of the air, the devil himself, the spirit of Antichrist, which now works, is going to work. The problem isn't so much that it's here. The problem is, is we're so quick to hold hands with it. But you find Noah, even in that culture, in that climate, the Bible says was a just man who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. 
Look at Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse number 5. Again, the Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts and of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. I'm going to tell you tonight, Christian, you will never truly understand the reliability of God until you have a real relationship with God. What moved Noah's feet to work and build the ark was because spiritually Noah's feet walked with God days, weeks, months, years before God ever came and brought this task to his attention. Noah walked with God. I want you to notice, Hebrews chapter 11, we are building we are building. It starts with by faith worship. Worship. You have to have a personal relationship with God through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as Abel brought that blood sacrifice. By faith worship. Then we saw Enoch by faith walk. But if you don't know how to worship and you don't know how to walk, you will never really know how to work. The reliability of God was solely based on his relationship with God. By faith work. You know, faith does that. James chapter 2 teaches us that a faith that does not produce work is dead. Faith and love are two of what I like to call activating verbs. Because if you have them and they're real, you can't keep them in. They always come out. By faith work. A faith that works will work with an incomplete explanation because God's proclamation is enough. A faith that works will do so with an immovable expectation knowing that God and His Word are always 100% reliable. And finally, a faith that works will do so with an impassioned effort. An impassioned effort. You know what Noah did? You know what Noah did? Noah did simply this. Exactly what God told him to do. Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 22, the Bible says this. Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 22. Brother Charles will get that up on the screen for us. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Noah, the Bible teaches, worked on the ark for 120 years. I'm going to tell you this, everybody loves the promises, amen? Who doesn't love to look at the promises of God? Everyone loves to claim the covenants. But why does it seem so few are really willing to keep the commandments? You think about how our world would have made fun of Noah. Noah, the, the lunatic, building a giant boat in the middle of a dry place in preparation for something that's never happened before. You think about how most churches would mock somebody like that today. And yet Noah did this. Not for six days, not for six weeks, not for six months, not for six years, not even for six decades, but for 120 years. Do you think it ever got heavy? Do you think it ever got old? 
Do you think Noah ever wondered in his heart, is it really worth it? I'm still waiting for whatever this is going to be. I'm still preaching something that's never happened. I'm still building something no one's ever needed. Why? And yet he continued. And Noah worked day after day after day after day with no reward, with no fruit to show. Noah worked day after day after week after year after year after year. And eventually, Noah received the fruit because he kept the faith. You want to know why Noah's family walked on that boat with him? I'm going to tell you, if my dad was building a big old boat and told me, come get on it, like, I'd be a little skeptical. But you know why Noah's family walked on that boat with him? Because they had watched him faithfully walk with God for hundreds of years. You know why Noah saw the fruit? Because Noah was faithful. Because Noah was faithful. You know, Paul admonishes us in Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season, he says, we shall reap if we faint not. We all want fruitfulness. We all want to see our bus routes and our classrooms and our churches exploding with fruit. We all want to see God answering prayer, God healing sicknesses, God making ways financially, people getting saved. We all want to see people catching fire, our communities being turned upside down for the cause of Christ. We all want to see the fruitfulness. Amen? If you want to see the fruitfulness, you've got to be faithful. Amen. You've got to be faithful when no one else in the world understands. When everyone else in the world mocks you and belittles you and reviles you and uses you and persecutes you and looks down on you and curses your name and spits on you. If you want to see the fruitfulness, when it's good times, when it's bad times, when it's, when it's bountiful or when it's lean, just be Faithful. You want to repair your marriage? You be faithful to be the spouse that God has ordained you to be. Whether they appreciate it, whether they accept it, whether they get on the same, you be faithful. You be faithful. No exceptions. No exceptions. No excuses. Just faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse number 58. Paul wrote, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in Vain in the Lord. Be faithful. An impassioned effort will finish the work. But we also see a faithful worship. One of the most striking things about this man, Noah, to me is this. The Bible says at the end of that verse that not only was it the saving of his house but by the which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Meaning, Noah then became, like Adam, a central figure from which all humankind would come down from. But one of the most interesting things about Noah to me is what he did when he stepped off that boat. Could you imagine 40 days and 40 nights? I mean, it rains. The Bible says that it came from above and it came from below. The fountains of the deep were broken up. I mean, there was catastrophic flooding globally. Everything that had breath died. Save Noah, his family, and those animals on that boat. Can you imagine, even after the rain stopped, the days, the weeks, the months, that that boat sailed along until it finally came to rest? 
Can you imagine even the days that passed as Noah waited, even though the boat was at rest, for God to give him the green light to get off that boat? And when he stepped off that boat, can you imagine with me for a moment the devastation that he saw? I can't even begin to think of what was there. I mean, we've all seen recent pictures in, in history of flooding and other things that have happened in our own country. Devastating, catastrophic flooding. Nothing, nothing compared to the global flood of Noah's day. But can you imagine really the desolation that was there? I have to imagine that the silence was eerily haunting. I have to imagine as he looked around at no place to live, not a whole lot to eat, no one else in the entire world to get help from. I have to imagine that in Noah's heart, there was a little bit of fear. Yet Noah when he stepped off the boat, worshipped. Genesis chapter 8 and verse number 20 tells us this. And Noah builded an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings to the Lord. Not only was Noah, uh, not only did Noah was he faithful to finish the work, but Noah was also faithful to worship. Worship as he stepped off the boat was his number one priority. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20, in fact, is the first specific mention of the altar in Scripture. And so Noah teaches us this that you cannot work by faith and not really worship. Be like the church of Ephesus, who's busy, 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 but who had left their first love. That duty and devotion, they go hand in hand. Worship. I'm going to tell you, this idea of working by faith, by faith working, a faith that works, is not at all what we dream it to be. A faith that works, the Bible teaches, is one that will work even with an incomplete explanation. It's one that operates on an immovable expectation. And it's one that will give an impassioned effort, no matter the cost, no matter the circumstances, no matter the length of time. Noah was a man, the Bible teaches, who worked in a wicked age, but who didn't let that wicked age work in him. And you know what our world needs today? Our world doesn't need a Noah. No. Our world needs a Jack Foster. Our world needs a Laura Hunley, a Mike Neisler, a Grant Stenson, a Daniel Barlow, who will say, you know what? No matter the cost, by faith, I'm going to work for God. Would you stand with me tonight, heads bowed and eyes closed?